programming on Montana PBS is made possible in part by viewers like you. And by the BZN International Film Festival, a four-day event showcasing films that educate and inspire audiences to get involved and take action to protect our planet. For more information, visit bozemanfilmcelebration.com. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, the Montana Bankers Association, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Gallatin Gardeners Club, and the Rocky Mountain Certified Crop Advisor Program. I've got hoppers in my wheat and my corn is not too sweet. Taters lying on the ground and my hay is turning brown. I've planted and I've watered, I've done everything I ought to. Montana Ag Live, where are you? Good evening, folks. Welcome to another new edition of Montana Ag Live. Originating tonight from Montana's beautiful Galton Valley, our homes in that place, and also the enchanting Bitterroot Valley tonight, as we have one of our guests from the Corvallis area. I'm Jack Rieselman. I'll be your host this evening, retired professor of plant pathology, and following Hayden Ferguson's footsteps, happy Mother's Day to all of you who qualify out there. We really enjoy that you're watching us. I appreciate it. And I hope you had a great day and we'll have a great evening. Tonight we have kind of a special program. It's a gardening special and we're going to focus on gardening questions, lawn questions, flower questions, so forth and so on. If you have questions about crops, weeds, things like that, go ahead and phone them in. We can use them next week if we can uh, attach them tonight. But anyway, keep the phones busy. It's you who keep this program going. We need your questions, and I have a lot of them left over from last week, so we'll get to those in a little bit. But first, let me introduce the panel. We don't have a real special guest tonight. We just have a panel of experts. Let's start with Cheryl Moore Golf. Cheryl, she's our extension portrait culturalist here at Montana State University, very knowledgeable about all kinds of house plants, garden plants, et cetera. Zach Miller. Zach is a fruit tree specialist. He's also superintendent at the Corvallis Station. He's joining us from Bitterroot Valley tonight. So welcome, Zach. If you have questions about fruits tonight, it's a good night to get a good answer. Mac Burgess, Mac, Mac's a small farm specialist. Uh, you might call him a truck farm specialist. He is very knowledgeable about some of the new small industries, agriculture industries that are occurring in Montana. And then there's Don Mathry. Don is a retired professor of plant pathology extraordinaire. Right now, I like to refer to him as a professional gardener. He's president of Young Gardeners Club, and he is a practicing, very practicing gardener. So with that, folks, start the questions. I see a few coming in already, but let me start with some from last week. This question came in from Cardwell. They had voles bad this winter, lawns, gardens, shrubs, any solutions? We don't have a small animal specialist on, but Cheryl informed us that she does have some suggestions. So Cheryl, you wanna take that one? Um, there, I'd be happy to uh, take that. Um, I had extensive vole damage in my yard this last winter. I live right next to a, what I guess you'd call a vacant lot and they destroyed my perennial beds and got into my grass. I also had a site, site visit um, of some folks who have a similar situation and they literally had thousands of dollars of damage to woody ornamentals, to their shrubs, their apple trees, and it was really heartbreaking to see. Um, there really hasn't been a whole lot we can say to people as far as controlling bulls other than um, try to exclude them if you can. Um, there are some products that you can get uh, that work marginally to repel them. Uh, snap traps will also work, although 
These voles, they have up to three generations per year. So they're very, very prolific. Fortunately, I stumbled across a publication that was put out by the Department of Agriculture, Montana Department of Agriculture, and it's um, voles in Montana. It has just been updated. The previous version of this was five pages long. This one is 12 pages. And it's written by uh, Steve Van Tassel with the Montana Department of, of Agriculture. It's very thorough. It, it uh, covers both agronomic and home issues. And I would strongly suggest you either contact the Department of Agriculture or download it off of the web, which is what I did. Um, it's fabulous information, much more than what I used to say was essentially get a cat. And he essentially says, no cats are ineffective against bulls. Thanks, Cheryl. Yeah. Uh, Department of Ag is very helpful in a lot of different areas. And they're also sponsored Montana Ag Live. So contact them. Uh, they do have a lot of information. And Steve Van Tassel is a real resource when it comes to small animal pests. Uh, Don and Matt uh, from Cutbank, this came in again last week. They have a lot of flea beetles and brassica crops. Any suggestions on how you can avoid that or minimize the damage? Well, Mac, I'll take a first stab at that. Uh, one thing you can do is try to grow those crops under row cover. Uh, that kind of minimizes them a little bit. Uh, the other thing, if that's uh, not uh, practical, uh, which in our case in the garden club, it would just take too much. Uh, we just let the plants uh, outgrow them. Very seldom will they really kill a plant. And usually by the latter part of the season, uh, there's other issues that we have to deal with, but not uh, flea beetles. So it's a matter of just kind of outlasting them and, and uh, not trying to spray anything. I don't know of any spray that really would work. Can I add to that? Um, you can also plant trap crops. So something that you know flea beetles will absolutely go to inevitably like radishes uh, and that may keep them away from your more desirable crops. You're saying radishes aren't any good? <laughs> no, radishes are adored by, the greens are adored by flea beetles. I know that and so <laughs> the roots too. And you can cut away a lot of the damage. Right. The red mustards are supposed to be the most attractive to them, and so maybe that's the, the trap crop. You can spray a pyrethroid or pyrethrin, which would be the, the organic uh, version of that that's made from chrysanthemum flowers. The, the, something like pyganic would be a formulation of that. That'll, that'll knock them back, but they'll be back. Um, and so you, once you spray that once, you need to spray it a, again every few days. And um, if that can get your plants through the, a critical growth stage to where they're able to outrun them, that, that can be useful. Um, that's probably more likely for a small farm situation. You know, and uh, arugula is not going to be marketable if it's been eaten extensively by flea beetles, but a, a big healthy cabbage transplant, I, I would say if your cabbage plants aren't able to outrun flea beetles, they've got other problems too. Okay, thanks guys. Uh, Zach, this came in a couple of weeks ago and we've had nobody really to answer it. It's from Polson. This person planted cold tolerant grapes and they are labeled sulfur sensitive. Can you explain what's going on there? Yeah, so some of the, some grape varieties uh, are sensitive to sulfur fungicide sprays. Um, and in Montana, we, we don't really have a lot of uh, fungal disease pressure. And so it shouldn't be a, a very big issue. And they can also use um, copper and other formulations to control fungal disease if they get any. How successful are the cold tolerant grapes here in Montana? They're quite successful. I mean, Montana now has over 50 vineyards and about uh, 17 wineries. Um, and uh, yeah, th there are uh, a lot of different grape varieties available now that can withstand 35 to 40 below over the winter. Now that's a lot of wineries, but they got a long way to go to catch up with the number of microbreweries. In yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> got to start somewhere. Yeah, that's true. Don, um, this came in from Jim and Bill, and he would like to know how much cow manure should I put on my garden he obviously has bags of it, and the bags are three years old. Will it still work? Oh, I think it'll probably still work all right. 
uh, the information that I've seen is that uh, put about an inch of that uh, on the soil and, and then till it in. Um, it's mainly going to be good for uh, providing organic matter. Uh, if it's three years old, there probably is not a lot of uh, nitrogen left in it. So uh, be sure to get nitrogen in some other way, but uh, certainly it's very great for uh, providing organic matter. All right, thanks, Don. Uh, Cheryl, what's the best soil mix for small space gardening from Great Falls? Best soil mix for small space gardening? Yeah, pot gardening, I assume they're talking about. Is well, when, when, I, when I filled my raised beds, I bought a uh, combination of compost and soil. So it was essentially half and half. And I think it was a little bit rich in the compost. Uh, it probably should have been more like a quarter, three quarters, uh, less compost than, than the soil uh, should be. Uh, I had a little bit of trouble with uh, the decomposing of the compost, tying up nutrients. Um, and it settled down after a couple of years, but the first year was a little iffy. So I would say if you, if you have a source of good non-contaminated compost in soil, maybe a quarter to three quarters. Okay. Thank you. Uh, from Fromberg, an interesting question. Uh, I'll direct this to Zach. Do ornamental pears cross pollinate with European and Asian pears? Uh, I believe so, um, but I, but I'm not exactly sure. I do. We deal mostly with the, but entirely with the edible pears here. Okay, uh, Mac. This person. Uh, has had cutworms in his garden for years. Any solutions or just let them run the course? <laughs> you know, for field crops, I, I, I hate to be the guy who keeps telling you to spray things. I know for field crops, the, the pyrethrins, again, are effective on cutworms and you spray them at night when they're out. Um, I, I've never seen a real big problem with them uh, in, a, in a garden space, so I uh, wouldn't have any other advice, but yeah, chickens would go get them, huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, I have, always have to throw in a humorous question. So this one came in from Helena, it's from Chris and Helena. Is there any good way to keep my neighbor's cat from using my garden as a litter box? Anybody have a suggestion? A dog. <laughs> a dog, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are some repellents available. Um, I think that's anise based. Um, I have tried it and I still have the cat in my garden. Fortunately, it only uses the flower bed. It doesn't get into my vegetable garden. So I'm, I'm happy about that. And so would prefer it continue to use my flower bed to my vegetable, but there are repellents that are available. Another, okay. another feasible option would be putting down some mulch or uh, weed barrier of some sort and that'll the cats are just going after the leaf soil but and at the same time you're going to keep more moisture in the soil and keep the weeds down well, i've got you up zach and this question has been coming in from helena all three weeks and we'll finally have somebody that can answer it when is the best time to spray apple trees and plum trees and that's from helena so when you're growing fruit trees uh you're gonna spray more than one time a year. So there's no one good time. The, the correct time to spray them is when they need it. So when you have the pests um, and when those pests are at the right life uh, stage where your spray will actually work. So a typical uh, homeowner spray program for tree fruits will uh, often involve a dormant oil spray that you're putting on before the buds break, and that will kill a lot of the uh, aphid eggs and other eggs of uh, the insect pests that have been laid on the tree. And then you'll be spraying in apples, you'll be, the next spray will be for coddling moth, um, which is a degree day or temperature-based model, um, but it's typically a couple weeks after bloom. You don't wanna ever spray, the worst time to spray a fruit tree is when it's in bloom. Okay. Unless, unless you're trying to abort the fruit with, um, right. Ethanol. Unless you're trying to control fire blight, but, or, or abort the fruit, but, right. if, but most, most homeowners are spraying insecticides. Um, so that's what I'm talking about here. 
Jack, I noticed that question also included plums. I, I just have a comment. Uh, we have two Mount Royal plums yeah. in our yard, and my goodness, they are just covered with blossoms. They're beautiful this time of year. For another gigantic crop this year, mm -hmm. and I never spray my plum trees. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand why anybody really needs to spray plums because we don't really have any major pests that I Not can so. Okay. Uh, this is from Cowspell. Kevin, I have a large asparagus bed, many offshoots from the mother plant. Do I dig them up and replant, or what would you do with them? So I'll Thanks. take that. If you if you want more plants, dig them up and move them. Um, uh, asparagus beds will play out over maybe 20, 25 years. And so if you wanted to start them someplace else, uh, dig up those young ones and uh, do it when they're dormant. Uh, so you wanna mark them this year, the ones that you wanna dig up, uh, maybe flag them or something. And then next spring before they start growing, dig up that mini crown that's come off of the mother plant and move it to where you want your bed to be next. Okay, thank you. Uh, Don from Bozeman, I know you've grown onions for years. They have a definite problem of storing onions very long after they harvest them in the fall. Any suggestions on how they can maintain quality for a longer period of time? Well, the first thing is to take a look at what variety they're growing. Uh, there are certain onions like Walla Wallas, the sweet onions. Uh, they won't store more than maybe a, a month or two at the very most. And then there's another on the other opposite side of that is Alyssa Craig, which is an old, old variety. It's kind of a yellowish under. It's a very good storage onion. So I think if you dig your onions, uh, dry them out and put them in a cool, dry place, something like a little Craig will last probably till this time of the year. But don't expect something like Walla Walla to last. So choose your varieties carefully. And then those that are long storage, uh, store them properly. Don, is there anything? I'm going to leave the tops on until they're, they've dried down really well. And so you know, in a lot of places you could do that in the field, but in the Gallatin Valley, it's often starting to snow. That time. So you need you know, a place to, you know, hang them up with the top still on until those tops have thoroughly dried out. And, and if any of those stems are still green, eat those ones first, because the ones that where the stems dry down completely, those will be the ones that store okay. Do yellow and purple onions store better than white onions? There are storage types of all three colors and there are non-storage types of all three colors. And it has to do, I think a large degree with the sugar content. And I've had very good luck with storing a white onion Ebenezer and yellow onion Stuttgarter. They're both very good storage onions. Yep. Hey, thank you. And a backup call, um, this came in from Billings. And it says Colorado grows lots of onions. Do we have any commercial onion production in the state? I would say there's lots of small farms that grow, you know, fractional acreages of onions. Uh, the Towns Harvest Garden at, at MSU, we will grow many thousands of onions. So that's bigger than your average home gardener. And I, I know there's lots of lots of onions at the farmer's market that are locally produced, but I, there's not anybody growing onions for, you know, as a commodity for the national market, but over in, just over the border in Idaho, uh, and certainly in Washington and, and Colorado as well, in Utah, uh, there's commercial onion production. Okay, thanks, Matt. Uh, you can all take a stab at this one. It says the American domestic plum trees are in bloom. Don mentioned his was. It is going to be down to 29 degrees tonight in Glasgow. Will they be okay? So 20 28 is the temperature that I learned was the critical temperature for fruit trees. Zach, you might want to jump in on this, but um, I was, I was uh, always taught 28 degrees is when you have problems and not 29. <laughs> this is the advantage of doing this uh, remotely. So uh, at full bloom, 20 27 will give you 10% kill. And if it gets down to 22 for, for 23, you'll get 90% kill for plum. 
Okay. So they're pretty safe up north in Glasgow. Tonight. Yeah, as long as you're not, yeah. It, the, the typical rule of thumb for most of the fruit trees, the colder hardy fruit trees is if it gets to 25, you're gonna lose some blossoms. Okay. So now Thanks, flat yeah. temperature can be different than the air temperature if it's a cloudy night or a clear night. Mm -hmm. Would it help to water? People do, uh, they'll water um, to, mainly because the freezing process releases a lot of heat. Um, if you can get overhead water on, on the blossoms um, or get a wind machine. But if it's not getting close to, to the uh, 25, they'll, they'll pull through just fine. And okay. all those trees make a lot more blossoms than they can actually ripen. Right. Uh, from Billings. This is interesting. I'm going to see what the response is. This person wants to know why Dixon melons taste so good and can they grow similar melons in Yellowstone County? I'll take a step. <laughs> I think it's it's warm days and cold nights and you, uh, you probably do have enough warm days in Billings. In Bozeman, it's, uh, it's pretty hard. Yeah. I think there's a lot of places in Montana that could do that. And then there's just a lot of tricks to growing a good melon. Um, but uh, the, I think the warm uh, days and cool nights and enough moisture and the right variety at the right time, and you, you could yeah. do it in the short season. And the two, yeah, two, two of the warmest places in the state are Dixon, that, the, that valley, um, and, and Yellowstone Valley, um, for, because they've got warmer nights than a lot of the mountain valleys. Uh, other mountain valleys and it just gets yeah it's so hot there they'll get um last year i think they had a thousand growing degrees more than what we did in the bitterroot in dixon and down in um the columbus area and jack so many of our folks uh, know nina zydak she's been on the program a lot nina oh maybe 10 or 15 years ago used to run a truck farm over in the billings area and she would grow melons and i'm not quite sure which varieties but she would bring some of those up to Bozeman and bring them into the plant science building. And everybody knew when I yeah. melons up, uh, the odor just permeated the whole building and they were unbelievably good tasting melons. Yeah, I'll say pick them when they're ripe. And so all of the, the musk melon or cantaloupe type melons, they'll slip. And you don't want to pick them until that, that stem just slips right off the fruit. You know, at the peak of their season, you can get a decent uh, melon in the store, but many of the musk melons and cantaloupes sold in the store out of season just weren't, were picked too early. Uh, and that maybe ship a little bit better, but they don't, they don't taste as good as, as one picked at the height of its ripeness. Do you think ethereal or artificially ripened melons, Matt, do you know? I'm not aware of that. If they do, it doesn't work terribly great. Okay, uh, from Manhattan, somebody by the name of Kristen is wishing Cheryl a happy Mother's Day. Hi, Kristen, that's my oldest daughter. <laughs> and she also would like to know how to avoid blossom end rot on her tomatoes, which is a very common problem for a lot of gardeners in the state. Yes, it is. And it's a, essentially a calcium deficiency, but it can also be any kind of a nutrient imbalance can as, exacerbate it. Um, our native soils are not calcium deficient, but calcium moves with water. And so um, inconsistent watering is your number one culprit, uh, typically. Um, you need to be sure that you keep this soil evenly moist uh, you can do that by mulching uh, the surface and not allowing the soil to dry out completely and then flood and dry out and flood. So um, that's pretty much. Um, also, you might want to consider there are some varieties that are just more susceptible. And so if you uh, have grown something in your yard and you just always get blossom end rot, try something else, try a different variety. But I, blossom end rot is not a respecter of gardeners. I can have one plant with two on each side of it, same variety, and one of them will get blossom end rot. And so it's, it's a real mind blower, a baffler, and it's so disappointing because you care for those plants all season long and mm -hmm. they are 
mostly inedible and certainly not marketable. Okay, Don, do you uh, have problems at the Yelm Gardeners uh, with Blossom and Rock? Oh, we certainly have over the years that, uh, and we have gone to the trying different varieties and uh, we've, we found uh, one or two. One is a stiva that seems to have less of it. But the biggest thing is to control the watering. Uh, if you can water three or four times a week instead of just once a week, yeah. uh, we've had less loss of end run. But I would make a comment on some varieties. If you cut off that end and eat the good part of the tomato, it seems to be sweeter than normal. And actually, I like them a lot. So we don't throw away all of our blossom end rot unless the rod is so big that it consumes the entire tomato. So give it a try. See if it doesn't taste a little better. I agree with you, Don. Um, that's why I was saying mostly inedible. But what there is that's edible, I have always found to be quite a bit sweeter. Okay. I hadn't thought about that, but it doesn't make sense. Um, I may encourage a little blossom in rot if my tomato. <laughs> uh, from Laurel, uh, they have a sandbox with two inches of sand in it. Can they use that sandbox to plant cucumbers and tomatoes? If they add some soil. <laughs> <laughs> Pure sand doesn't work very well. No. no. But you can't add any water or nutrients. Okay. Uh, well, I've got you up, Zach. This came in from the Shields River Valley. Uh, they'd like to know, is it too late to fertilize my apple trees? And why don't you expand a little bit on tree fertilization? That's always a touchy issue. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the general rule of thumb is, is fertilize sort of uh, up to fruit set and not after. Because um, you don't want, uh, you want to get the fertilizer in to the soil where the plant can use it before it really starts growing and putting on that fruit. Um, fertilizing after fruit set can, um, or, or too late in, in the second half of the summer really can start to, um, it'll encourage more growth and that plant won't be ready for winter. Okay. Uh, the question here from Cowspell, and I, I find this interesting. This person has heirloom apples and some of the varieties like St. Edmund Russet and Ashmead's Kernel, and I've not heard of those. They get scab and bitter pit. Uh, they spray sulfur and most of the other trees do fine with this. This person hears that their calcium foliar spray can help and they'd like to know if they could use ice melt, which is calcium chloride to make a calcium spray. I don't think that would work. I don't think so, no. Um, but there are a lot of other uh, foliar calcium sprays that would be safer for the tree. Okay. Um, eggplants, this person from Belgrade would like to know, is there an eggplant variety that will mature in the Galton Valley. Don, do you know of any, or Mac, Cheryl? Yeah. The, Ori the Oriental eggplants, the, the Asian eggplants do, are very prolific and they set um, heavy, heavily and they are beautiful, beautiful plants. And um, I would recommend them trying one of those the Asian eggplant varieties. We've grown a small one called Nadia. It's a hybrid, uh, and it, it, it's done fairly well for us. Yeah. Back one year, we tried some of the Black Beauty, the old uh, standard eggplants from the Midwest. We grew them along the south side of a hoop house, and we actually got pretty good fruit. And I think it was because of the excess heat that was coming off that hoop house. But eggplants in general like lots of heat, and yep. some years in the Gallatin Valley, we just aren't going to have a good crop. Yeah. And all the usual tricks for heat, you know, plastic mulch underneath and some row cover, getting them going. And uh, oftentimes we get that August, September extended uh, warm fall and, and they can put on quite a bit of fruit at that time. So. Okay. Cheryl, this question again came in last week from Kalispell. They like edamame. Will edamame, edamame, grow here in Montana in gardens? Yes, I have been very successful with my edamame. But again, just as we were just talking about with eggplants, hot days, cold nights. 
is what edamame needs. So I have some of my raised beds that are up against a south facing fence. And so they get blasted with the heat during the day and then it gets really cold at night and I have bumper crops of edamame. Um, and believe it or not, it's better than in the restaurant, um, which homegrown vegetables usually are. But um, yeah, I've had great success. Carol, what do you do with it? It'd be a cook it or do you eat it raw? So it comes in fuzzy little pods and typically three seeds per pod and you can steam it. And then if you ever have gone to a sushi restaurant, you typically get that for an appetizer and they often put way too much salt on it. And uh, then you dunk it in soy sauce and you pop the little seeds out um, in your mouth and then throw away the, the pod um, they're very high in protein and very delicious. They freeze well also. They are really tasty. I like them. Oh, yeah. Um, we, we've grown edamame here as well, and there are some varieties that are just too long season for Montana, but there, there are a lot of varieties that will ripen just fine here. The one, the one that I have found to be very successful is called Beer Friend. It seems in Japan, the big treat is edamame and beer. Mm -hmm. Doesn't sound all bad. No. <laughs> okay. Um, question from South Bozeman, and I'm going to comment on this after you guys answer. But this person wants to know how high a deer fence do they need to protect their tulips? And deer just ravage tulips. Um, then I'm going to tell you a little story I found out last week. So, Mac, how high a fence would you suggest? Well, feet. No. <laughs> Depends on, I think deer have poor depth perception because the eyes are on the side of their heads. And so it kind of depends on what's on the other side of the fence and if they think they've got a landing zone. So yeah, I've, I've seen deer jump right over a 10 foot fence, uh, but it's only when they when they know they've got something to land on on the other side. I've also seen them get confused by a, a double layer like two fences that are four feet apart that are maybe only six feet tall. You know, and if it's tulips, you could build a fence that was two feet tall and put a top over it. And, and that, that right. might be from eating your tulips. If, you know, I'm assuming you're not, you don't have five acres of tulips. You have a, a garden bed of tulips. I, I'd make a short fence with a, with a top for, for that situation. I happen yeah. to be at a person's place, Don Hayden, who is a master gardener here in the Valley. Uh, tremendous operation. He has a seven foot deer fence around his tulip bed. And lo and behold, last week, right in the middle of that was a built deer. And when his wife tried to shoo it away, it didn't go back over the top. It went through the fence. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some other tricks that Perry Miller has used. And one is to take an electric fence around his garden and when the deer start showing an interest in his garden crops, he'll put some peanut butter spread on the wire and three or four days training, then he turns the electricity on and he claims the deer will not come back. And I think that's probably pretty effective. Yeah, and another uh, trick that Don Hayden has tried is to use a motion sensor uh, hooked up to a water sprinkler. And that is, I know worked for him at the times uh, the problem is if you get a freeze freeze one night and the hose freezes up, uh, that doesn't work very well. Yeah, and we, we do get freezes at this time of year when the tulips are out, no doubt. Uh, from Billings, this person would like to know what is the latest they can plant tomatoes and cucumbers in their home garden, Billings. The latest that they can plant? Well, they can plant them anytime during the summer. It depends on whether they want to get uh, some rice fruit or not. Uh, I like to get my tomatoes in the ground about the time of the last uh, frost, which around Bozeman is usually June 1st, and cross my fingers that I don't need to cover them up for a while. Mm -hmm. There are some cucumber varieties that will go pretty quick. And, and, you know, for our pickling cucumbers, we oftentimes put those in and then middle to even late June and, and they'll still make lots of pickles in, in the fall that there aren't there aren't really tomatoes that'll make fruit in 45 days quite like cucumbers can. I'd, I'd get them in in you know early June the latest. So it takes a, a tomato flower 
six to eight weeks to make a ripe tomato. And so the reference there is those of us who have our tomato plants in timely should start pulling off extra flowers um, if there just isn't time for that flower to make a fruit. So the plant's energy goes to ripening those fruits that have already set. So that being said, six to eight weeks for a tomato plant flower to make a tomato, that should tell you kind of how late you could plant a tomato and expect fruit. Okay. I usually try to get mine in the last week in May, protect them a little bit if necessary. And we actually covered them last year and we had a frost on June 11th. I had put five gallon buckets over them. They didn't make it. They got cold enough that uh, they froze under there. So anyway, um, this person from Billings, Paul, would like to know what to spray crab apple trees with to abort the blossoms so it does not produce. And I will say crab apples make good deer fruit. There's no doubt about that. It draws deer. So if you have deer problems and crab apples, they go hand in hand. Anybody have a good suggestion for that? I, I could take that one. Um, a product that contains either ethophon or naphthalene acetic acid is on the market. And uh, we actually had a question last week about the same thing. And they were curious as to whether this product would um, hurt birds. And so I actually dragged out a bottle of this product that I have on hand and birds are not mentioned on the label. Uh, it does, however, say to keep people and pets away from it. It's important when you use this product to read the label for the timing of the product. It's a certain stage that the um, flowers are at when you need to apply the product in order to abort the crab apples. Um, and I'm not sure if each product is different, but it's very, very specific and you need to get your product now so you have it on hand this year when uh, those petals are in the correct stage. Zach, do you have anything to add to that? In, in, in commercial orchards, they often use a combination of lime sulfur and fish oil or horticultural oil to thin blossoms. It's the same principle. It's a strong oxidizer acid that just damages, damages the flowers and they fall off. There are also some crab varieties that are um, that don't make the crab apples or are really susceptible to um, blossom blast, fire blight that doesn't get into the, the, the tree and damage it. Um, we've got a few here. I, I can't remember the variety, but there are varieties out there that just don't make that much fruit. They'll give you the great show in the spring with all the blossoms and then, um, uh, but don't, yeah, don't litter your yard with tiny apples. Yeah, my question is, are there any crab apple varieties? I remember as a kid, we had crab apple jelly, which of course any kind of jelly as a kid was good. But are there any particular varieties that produce edible crab apples to make jelly and or wine or whatever you want to use it for? Yeah, there's uh, so many, and they're a great choice for Montana because they're often earlier. Um, some popular ones, uh, cur crab is really uh, cold hardy, and it's a red fleshed crab. It's quite large. It's a uh, it gets about uh, two inches, two and a half inches in diameter. Um, excellent eating apple makes a uh, red. Uh, blushed cider that's really floral. It's a it's a great apple um, for crab. Chestnut crabs are really early, very sweet, nutty flavor. Um, there's also um, Hughes Virginia crab and um, Wixen crab are really popular uh, among the hard cider makers because they're really productive and they've got a really complex kind of uh, yeah complex flavor that that comes through well in fermented ciders. Will they all grow reasonably well here in Montana? Yeah, yeah, we have all of them growing right here. And I'd like to, I'd like to add um, Dolgo crab. Oh yeah, the beautiful, beautiful shaped tree, white blossoms, and the crab apples are about the size of the end of your thumb, so they're smaller, but they are very prolific and delicious. Okay, thanks, uh, Don. Uh, person from Conrad has said. For cabbage plants out. How much code in a collar 
can they tolerate before damage occurs? Jack, I'm not really quite sure about that, but I normally think of being cold crops as being fairly frost tolerant. And I would guess if the temperatures didn't get below 25 or so, they'd be okay. Um, maybe Zach or Cheryl has more experience with that, but we're planning to put out our cabbage plants uh, this week and uh, I think we'll be fine. They'll be fine. Uh, it, it depends. There's no firm hard cutoff temperature. It depends on the history of the plant. A little bit. If you, you take a plant that's only ever known warm temperatures in a greenhouse and you shock it uh, with an abrupt transition, you could injure it. But uh, if you put a plant out and, and it you know gets a, a gradual uh, customization to Montana life, they'll be fine. We put our uh, cabbage and kale plants out three weeks ago here in Bozeman, and, and they're under row cover, but I have no worries at all. They, they'll be fine. I always put mine out as soon as I can get them in the garden. And I've really had very, very little problems with it. Not always. I remember one morning at 17 degrees after they were out. And they didn't like that at all. So you never really know. Uh, Zach, Sharon from Helena, had, they have Nankin cherry trees. They are seven years old and they have not produced in the last several years. She'd like to know what can I do to get them going again so they produce. Any suggestions, Nanking Cherry? I haven't. We haven't grown those, um, but if it's not, yeah, if it's not producing, it's usually uh, some sort of damage to the flower buds um, from, from cold over the winter. Okay, but I, I we haven't worked with those. They're usually quite cold hardy, so that's surprising. Cheryl, have you grown Nankings? I've done Nanking cherry bushes. I actually yeah. have never heard of a Nanking cherry tree. Yeah, they're just a bush. They're a bush cherry. Yeah. yeah. They're a bush cherry, and which is why I was thinking one of the tricks of getting some a fruit tree to produce is ringing, um, but I'm not sure that that's something that a homeowner would want to try on a bush. Yeah. Um, that's kind of an involved technique that every single branch has to be treated, and I wouldn't suggest that. Okay, thank you. Um, this person has snowball bushes, and they have a serious aphid problem with it. Anybody have any solutions on how to minimize the aphid damage? Horticultural soap and um, continue to apply the soap every seven days because you're not going to kill them all. Aphids are born pregnant and so they have a very short life cycle. Uh, so they will produce and reproduce and reproduce and you have to stay on top of them. And horticultural soap um, is probably the best bet for those. Cheryl, do you think that applying a a, a dormant oil, especially in those snowball bushes where it's really hard to get into the into the plant after it's leafed out um, to smother the eggs. Do you think that'd work? I think it's too late for dormant oil. Right, for right. But proactively yeah. in the spring. Yes, yeah. I think that that could work. Um, I'm not aware of the fact that uh, aphids overwinter on uh, snowball bushes. They're typically overwintering on prunus species. Mm. Um, which may be nearby. So if you have a cherry or something near your snowball bush, maybe that's what should be treated with horticultural oil um, when it's dormant. So this time of year, it's just going to be the soap, but next spring or next, uh, yeah, spring before we get budding, then get out the horticultural oil and treat those trees. Yeah. What about some of the systemic ornamental uh, insecticides. Would they work in middle culprit or something that is registered on ornamentals? Do you think that would be pretty Yeah, good? it works really well for aphids. Sure. Okay. But I'm not so I'm not so sure that you'd want to use it on a flowering ornamental because of uh, damaging to honeybees. True. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, from Lewistown, this caller raised butternut butternut squash last year that was shaped more like a spaghetti squash, where the neck should have been, it was how, was this caused by too much or too little fertilizer or any suggestions what might have caused that type of reaction? 
almost sounds like a water issue. If it was more like spaghetti squash, that's kind of a drier, um, threadier. That's the only thing I could think of. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Missoula, last week, and this is a question that comes up quite often. Can you grow huckleberries in a home garden? No. <laughs> but there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of uh, easier alternatives. Um, there are a lot of uh, cold hardy blueberry varieties that will grow well if you can acidify your soil. But also um, honeyberries, honeyberries or hascaps are a cold hardy berry that's quite similar uh, to a huckleberry. Real, uh, yeah, it's an easy to grow blueberry. Um, not closely related to them, it's an edible honeysuckle, but uh, very cold tolerant and a great option if you want to grow berries in your backyard. So okay. I'd like to I'd like to piggyback on that. Um, as far as the blueberries are concerned, there are many places in the state that you cannot get your soil acidified enough yeah. to grow blueberries. Um, my late husband Bob Goff studied this at the horticulture farm, and he actually put sulfuric acid on the ground to bring the pH down so to grow his blueberries and they sort of survived but they did not thrive and they did not uh, produce berries so it's more yeah, than it's just starting off with a pH of about six um, and it's not buffer your soil's not buffered it's a it's a hard fight and there's a lot of other things other berry crops that will do just fine in pHs up to eight like a lot of our soils Yep. Okay, I'm going to put a little plug in for something we have relatively new, and it's called the Ag Live newsletter that's coming out through PBS. You can find out more about it by looking up montanapbs.org backslash Ag Live. And I encourage people that want a weekly newsletter, I believe it comes out weekly, uh, to join and get your name on that list. Uh, it's an interesting one. Is I, I grew up with mulberries. This caller lives in Plains, Montana, and that's a little warmer area of the state. And right along the river near Paradise, and she finds mulberry plants that are native there. Are there good recipes for mulberry and other uses for this fruit? And Don, you know mulberries too from being from the Midwest. Who wants well, to always used to make pies out of mulberries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Raspberry, uh, mulberry custard pies, mulberry pies. Um, and in the Midwest, they grew wild along a lot of the rivers back there. And if you wanted to catch catfish that really tasted good, you fished under a mulberry tree. Yeah. They love feeding on those. Okay. Uh, Kathy from Bozeman has a chestnut crab apple tree that was severely pruned at the bottom by renters. And some new growth at the top. Is there anything they can do to help bring the tree back to good health? Patience. I I would Patience. have to. I'd have to take a look at the tree itself. I'd have to yeah. do a site visit. Um, but there are there, there are typically lots of uh, do, old buds buried in the bark lower down. Um, you you will see some new growth, um, new shoots coming out of the that lower part of the tree that was severely pruned. Okay, thank you. Don, this question came in from Bozeman. They said they often buy turnips. They're called salad turnips at the farmer's market. They want to know, can they grow and get seed for salad turnips? Well, we grow them. They're called hikori, uh, white salad uh, turnips. They are absolutely delicious and they're actually in pretty good demand. Uh, I, I always buy our seed. I'm not sure you could get turnips. They might even be a biennial as far as seed production is concerned. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't even bother to do that. I just uh, buy your seed from one of the reputable seed dealers and uh, you're going to enjoy them. What was the name again, Don? Hikuri, H-I-K-U-R-E-I. -E one caution. Uh, the beetles like to get into those turnips, and so we always grow them under row covers. And that way we minimize, I wouldn't say we eliminate, but we minimize uh, the flea beetle damage to, to the roots. But they certainly are, are very tasty. I like them. 
I really do. They're, they're really delicious. Um, this one I'm not familiar with the berry. When is the best time to harvest Aronia, A-R-O-N-I-A berries? Um, help me out with that one, folks. That's foreign to me. Yeah, so typically with it, it, Aroni is a cold hardy berry. Max growing them, we're growing them. Um, there, there's quite a bit of production in the Midwestern states. Um, it's a very uh, high antioxidant fruit, um, and they hang. Uh, they usually ripen in Montana in uh, August to early September, and they hang on the the bush really well. Um, you can pick them when you get to them. They're one of the only berries that uh, are not preferred by birds. So you can, the, the birds won't steal them as they're ripening. You can just let them hang and they'll, um, yeah, once, once they get fairly sweet, um, and that's typically end of August, um, you can pick them. They're, uh, they're very, very tannic, like a choke cherry. So they dry your mouth out. Um, but they're, uh, they're great for blending into things. Yeah, I don't think they're ever going to ripen to be something you want to just pop in your mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can get the juice out of them and use that to color things up. And they've got some, they've got quite a bit of sugar in them. They're just balanced by a lot of other stuff. Yeah. And you know, I've made concentrate out of them and it's delicious. Um, that, and they're used a lot for wineries uh, and sort of health food applications. You also, it's also one of the, you'll commonly see it in fruit blends because it adds a really uh, uh, it adds a lot of color in low concentrations. So if you're looking for a natural red fruit dye uh, or food colorant, that's a great one. I'll also put in a plug since we're talking about berries, um, we've been working with berry growers across the state to put out uh, um, webinars and every Friday for the last five weeks we've been doing uh, berry webinars. There'll be another one next Friday um, at 10 a.m. And uh, you can get the information about that on our website. Um, we are also working with the uh, growers across the state to put together a gro Berry Growers Association for Montana. Um, and if you're interested, contact me at the Western Ag Research Center and I'll get you uh, linked up with that group. So my question is, I have a whole lot of choke cherries around my place here. And you'll never get a choke cherry because the robins beat me yeah. too. <laughs> What's the difference if the aronia berry and the choke cherry, why the birds prefer one and not the other? Any clues there? I think it's a bit timing. Um, aronias are... are are, uh, are ripening later in the season, um, but I'm not sure exactly. But all I know is that it's the only berry that I've seen that has a, uh, that you can actually pick it without putting a net over it to keep the birds off. Okay, thank you. Um, Cheryl, this came in last week. It's an interesting question. It came from Helen and they would like to know, do a lot of wild, our mixes contain potential invasive weed species. Good question. So you broke up a little bit, Jack, but I think you said do um, wildflower mixes have potentially invasive seeds? Correct. Yes, they absolutely can. And so that's a, a real important thing for you to take a look at is what exactly is in that blend, because there are um, lots of blends that are on the market that just aren't appropriate for every single area. So it's a good idea to get um, acquainted with what's on the um, noxious weed list for the state of Montana and also for your county. Um, also, uh, you should know that a lot of those seeds that are in those mixes will self-sow very freely. And so you may end up with a ton of say bachelor buttons, um, which you really didn't want to have to begin with. but do pay attention to the seed mix. If you have any questions about the invasiveness of those seeds, contact your local extension office and ask them. Okay, thank you. Don, we're getting a little on time here, but um, I'm gonna draw back into your plant pathology expertise. This person has some young maples that had anthracnose in them here in Bozeman last year. 
I had the same issue. Mine was due to watering at night and the plants never drying out. Do you have any other suggestions? I think I would just ignore it. I don't think in, it is mainly a, a really serious problem. So uh, don't worry about it. Yeah, it makes them look nasty, but mine do, did recover, even though I did use some Dacanil on them too late. It did not help. But okay, folks, I want to thank everybody that's been here tonight. It's uh, a pleasure to have Zach from over in the Bitterroot area, the Enchanted Valley. I like it over there. And it's a lot easier doing this online than it is you driving over all, all the time, even though it's not quite as personal. Next week, folks, uh, we have Anton Beckerman, and Anton is. Uh, ag economist that has broad interest. In addition to that, he's currently the associate director of the Montana Agricultural Experiment Station College of Ag. Uh, he's going to talk about COVID-19 and the effects on agriculture going forward. Folks, thank you for watching. Happy Mother's Day. Good night. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, the Montana Bankers Association, Cashman